Good to be with you tonight. Amen. Good to be here. Good to have God's word in our hands. We believe it. We have faith in it. We trust it. It's the only thing that's right. And uh, I want you to think of something here in a little bit, um, because we're talking about the gospel, and I'm going to get to a place here in the notes where it talks about the gospel defended, okay? So I want you to think of other religions in the world, and I'll I'll put it to like this, other non-Christianity-based religions, okay? Um, Like Islam, okay, Islam, or Buddhism, or Shintoism, or animism. Um, What other kind of religions are there? Okay, I want you to think about just different kinds of religions, religions all over the world that are not based upon Christianity or have anything to do really with Jesus, all right? Just think about that, and there's a question I'm going to ask you here in a little bit, okay? So, uh, we left off uh, last Wednesday night uh, dealing with the fact that the gospel, the real gospel, is not ever of works. Uh, and I read 1 Corinthians 1, 2 Corinthians 11, Isaiah 55. Uh, we talked about, uh, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come ye and buy. And uh, was just sitting this afternoon thinking, just pondering things. And the Holy Ghost kind of led my thoughts toward this word in the Bible called the traffickers. Trafficking. What does that word mean, trafficking? When, you, when things are trafficked. Okay. It's not just meant driving them. When they traffic human slaves, what are they doing it for? Money. Okay. I got to thinking about that. And um, there is a lot in the Bible that talks about the corruption that comes from money. And I don't quite understand it, but we know the Bible's telling us that Satan lusts after wealth, riches, money, merchandise, That's told to us in the scriptures. When our Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, that is accurate. It's a very accurate statement. Why does a politician go bad? Why does somebody go into politics to begin with? Okay, money. How is it you pay a politician, what, $120,000 a year? And after two years... They're multimillionaires. How does that work? Huh? It is? No, it's not. It's not weird. I, nah. You understand how stuff works. You go, yeah, that makes sense. Okay? How did, how did Bill and Hillary Clinton go when they left the White House? Clinton, Hillary Clinton said that they were dead broke. That's what they said. We're dead broke. So how did they go from dead broke to their their admitted net worth over $150 million? How did that happen on a Secretary of State's salary? She was Secretary of State for what? Two years, three years, four years? Four years? Okay. How did that work? How did she get... $150 $150 million rich out of being the Secretary of State for four years. Okay? There's something going on. You agree with that? Say amen. Okay? So it gave me the idea, and there's, the more you think about it, there's a lot in the Bible about this. 
about the difference between heaven and earth and the spirit of heaven, the spirit of earth. Heaven is a city that is so full of free wealth that the streets are paved with gold. We're walking on gold. Most precious, valuable material on the earth is gold. Okay? And that's pavement in heaven. Okay? So it tells you just how rich heaven is. Uh, and God shares that with us freely. So you think of the opposite. The spirit of this world is Babylon. Babylon is a what? She's the mother of harlots. Okay? And harlots are all about the money. The money, the money, the money, the money, the money. That's all they care about. That's why they do what they do. It's for money. And so churches are hooked in with this. Politicians, big, big. I'm a capitalist. But unrestrained capitalism leads to excessive greed and excessive money and excessive power. So it's like, who has the, who has the ability to tell the United Ta States Postal Service, I'm not paying the price that you're charging me. I'm going to pay a substantially reduced price for everything that I ship through the United States Postal Service. Who has the ability to tell them that? Huh? Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos does not send packages at the same rate that you and I send packages. He gets a drastically reduced price as a result of it because he has wealth and he has power and he has influence. Okay? And there was a hint at one time that he might buy out the U.S. Postal Service, make it his own private delivery service. Wouldn't that be a hoot? Okay? So I'm, I'm for capitalism, but I am against unrestrained capitalism. Okay? Anyway, so that's something I was thinking about today. And that reminded me of Isaiah 55, where the most precious thing that a man can own is salvation. And it was... By the way, the most costly thing to obtain, because it cost God the life of his only begotten son, a precious price, okay? But through that, we have been bought and purchased and redeemed by God, and to us, it costs nothing to both receive the gospel and then to give the gospel to other people. And that's where that comes in. Uh, he says, uh, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. That's what he says in Isaiah 55, 1. Buy it without price. It's, there's not any charge for it. So then that makes the preachers of the true gospel an automatic enemy of any religion who seeks to try to sell you the same thing. If they're selling you the same thing, and we come along and say, but we're offering it to you for free, okay? then the people who are selling it, the <coughs> Roman Catholic Church, and others, don't like us for that very reason. Amen? So it's not of works, all right? Uh, Galatians 3, 8 in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel on Abraham, saying, in thee shall all the nations be blessed. In other words, it's absolutely free of charge. All we have to do is believe, all right? Now, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll start uh, out here. We're going to move from dealing with the gospel here shortly to touching on the, the important doctrines of salvation. What is salvation? What does it accomplish? How long does it last? Um, can it be faked? Can salvation be pretended? 
Can people say they're saved who are not really saved? Can a church say someone who is say that someone is saved who maybe in God's eyes are not really saved? Is that possible? The answer to all of that is yes. All right. So let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Appreciate you being here. Uh, pray for one another. Pray for those who are still affected by COVID and maybe some other diseases. You know, all the focus and attention gets on one disease and you got people who are dying of others who are not afforded decent care because all the attention is going to a virus that still hasn't killed as many people as the flu has this year. Still hasn't. So I don't know. Anyway, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for uh, a beautiful day. Lord, we thank you for these April and May showers. It's filling up all the wells with water. And Lord, it's going to make our grass grow good and green and tough, make the trees put out a lot of fruit. The fields, dear God, are going to produce a lot of wheat, a lot of corn, a lot of soybeans in this country. Things that this world needs. And Father, we just pray, dear God, that you would uh, bless the fruit of our labor as we labor in your word, as we study. I pray, dear God, that it would bring forth the peaceable fruit of righteousness in our life. Father, we don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. But we believe your word. And so, Father, we pray, dear God, that you would prepare us for every eventuality, every possibility. God, that you would fill our minds and our hearts with answers. Because I believe, Father, that we're going to get into a time when a lot of people are going to be looking for the truth. They're going to be looking for answers. God, I do not believe for a minute that you are done working in this earth. I don't believe for a minute, God, that you're about ready to give up on everybody and turn everybody over to the Antichrist. I believe, Father, that the days that are ahead of us are better than the days that are behind us if we trust in you. And if we gauge those better days the way you see them and not, Father, the way we've been trained to see them by this world. Father, help us to not seek out the wealth and the riches of this world. But help us, Father, to seek out the wealth of your word. Bless us tonight. Bless all of those who are with us online. We appreciate them. Pray to God that you'd always bless them. And Father, let us at this church always be a blessing both to them and to one another. Bless, Father, the fruit of my lips tonight and the fruit of study. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. I like you. She has got so much of me in her. First Corinthians, it's new birth. The gospel, the gospel brings a new birth. Jesus said, it's like the man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of heaven. He told that to Nicodemus. Nicodemus said, how can I be born again? How can I go into my mother's womb again? Jesus said, that which is born of Flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. It is an entirely different birth. And if the gospel that is preached in a, in a church or taught in a religious setting does not produce a new birth, it is not the gospel. In fact, it's the opposite of it. Because while those people then are convinced that they're saved, they're doomed. They've accepted a false gospel for their salvation and they are doomed. And there's no, by the way, there's no excuse for it. Any one of us, any one of us can read the Bible by ourselves and learn the gospel. Anybody can. I, I mentioned here a while back the story of the, 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 the book I read, Robinson Crusoe. I had a children's album when I was growing up and it told the story of Robinson Crusoe and I really liked it. Then one day I was an adult and I just felt like, you know, I've never read the book. So I bought a copy of the book. It's in paperback. And I was absolutely stunned. It's actually based upon the real life 
uh, happenings of a man by the name of Alexander Selkirk who was uh, left on an island all by himself. He had to learn how to survive on that island. And um, this is how we can adapt. That island was full of goats, wild goats. And he's going, there's a meal. Problem is, he would try to approach them and they'd run away from him. So when you're hungry, Sterling, you don't run as fast as you can. You run as fast as you have to. And when he was finally rescued, he showed the guys that rescued him, they said, because he was wearing, you know, goatskin cap and goat skins for clothes and goatskin shoes, and they're going, How'd you catch these things? He said, Watch this. And he took off running, and he had one by the neck like this, and they're going, I ain't never seen nothing like that in my life. But anyway, in the story, Robinson Crusoe, at one point he's sick. He's real bad sick. And he remember, he rescued the captain's chest of stuff from the ship. And he got a bunch of stuff off the ship before the current blew the ship out. And he's laying there just, and he feels terrible. He's got a, he's got a sickness, a fever. And he's reaching in the captain's chest because he knows there's some rum and some tobacco in there. What he's going to do, he's going to make a mixture of it and drink it as a purgative to try to purge that out of him. I think it would have worked. As he's reaching in, fishing for that bottle of rum, he pulls out the captain's Bible. King James Bible. And he opened it up and he found the gospel in there and realized that God had him on that island because he rebelled against his father and he was living in rebellion and sin and God saved him that day. He implored the mercies of God on that island. And I'm just going, I had never heard that before. Yeah, amen. I encourage you to read it. All right. But it's a, it's a new birth. Okay. It is a new birth. First Corinthians 4, 15. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ... Yet have you not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. In fact, if you are begotten in Christ, who then is your father? God in heaven. So then, is it proper, you folks in Turkana, is it proper to call a man in this world, a religious man in this world, father. No. Is it okay then to call the Pope of Rome holy father? No, that's blasphemy. That term's only used one time in the scriptures. And it's used in John 17, and Jesus said, I come to thee, Holy Father. There's only one Holy Father. Blasphemy for anybody else to call themselves Holy Father or even Father. If you ever get into a conversation with a Catholic priest, don't call him Father. Call him Priest. Call him Bob. Whatever. But Jesus said, call no man your Father. Amen? So the new birth has... God now as your father, your earthly father was the father of your first birth. Your heavenly father is the father of your second birth. That makes us sons of God. All of us sons of God. Okay. And we will be joint heirs with Jesus because he's going to share it with his brethren. All right. First Peter 1 23 being born again, not of corruptible seed. And I have this theory. That says, I believe that at the time of the appearing of the Antichrist, there is going to be a transformation take place of every man, woman, and child on the earth. I believe they will be born again. Of corruptible seed. I believe that. I, 
Um, Hitler was all about creating the new man. Communism, early communist teachings taught about the advent of the new man. Now we live, 21st century, technology everywhere is edging, slowly edging toward the recreation of humanity. They call it homo novus, which means the new man. They call it homo nexus, the next man. They call it uh, homo evolutus, the evolution man, the changed man. There's different names for it, but through technology and biology and genetics and whatever else they're going to throw into it, we are slowly but surely edging toward a time that will transform every man, woman, and child on this earth. And I promise you, I promise you, it will not be done by force. It'll be done by choice. People will want this. They'll want the superpowers. They will want whatever this thing has to offer them. They will want it. Just like Eve wanted what she was going to get from that fruit. The desire to make her wise. She was told that by eating that fruit, her eyes would be open and she would know what all the gods know. She would have their knowledge. And we know from Ezekiel 28, uh, uh, Ezekiel said, of Satan, the prince of Tyrus, behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. So it is going to be in man's lustful interest to want to accept that mark because it's going to be a mark of transformation. It's going to change them. But in that process, it's going to doom them for eternity. There'll be no turning back from it. Amen? Being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And so, if your salvation is corrupted somehow, it can only be because the source of that salvation was already corrupted. Does that make sense? So, I mean, people ask me all the time, Pastor, are you saying that uh, you know, I've got family, they all read the NIV and they say they're saved and so on. Are you saying they're not saved? It's not for me to say. It's not for me to look at anybody and say, according to what I think, you're not saved and you can't be saved and you're reading anybody, there's no way. Because I don't know the outcome of that person's life. They may read that NIV for about a year and say, you know what, that just don't sound Bible. There's something better than they get a King James and they're going, this is it right here. That's happened already. That's happened before. So I can't judge, the Bible says, judge no man before the time. But I'm telling you that if you are saved by an incorruptible seed, can an incorruptible seed later become corrupt? No. It's not possible. So an incorruptible seed, the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, generates a new creature that is also incorruptible and lives and abides forever. John chapter 3, turn there. This is Jesus' talk with Nicodemus. I'd like to meet him one of these days. Looking forward to it. So I, believe he's, I believe he's there. John 3, 3, Jesus answered and said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So, and this, you have to understand, this was a brand new concept. Never really been understood in the Old Testament. Never really been seen. Uh, David may have had a piece of it when he said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. 
I think he had a little bit of understanding of it, but he didn't see the whole picture. Now we're given the whole picture. For the first time in history, after 4,000 years since Adam, now Jesus comes along and says, here it is right here. You must be born again or you will never see the kingdom of God. Some, it, here it's the kingdom of God. In the book of Matthew, it's referred to as the kingdom of heaven. Both of those terms mean the exact same thing. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven. Where does God live? In heaven. It's his kingdom up there. Where's he bringing it to? Down here to this earth. In the form of Jesus, when he comes the second time, that's his kingdom here on this earth. And then after that, we have the new heavens and the new earth. The old earth and the old heavens are passed away. There's no more sea. That kingdom then will last forever and ever and ever and ever. Let me just throw this in as a question. Will there be anybody, once we enter into the new heaven, the new earth, will there be anybody who will have an opportunity to transgress God and be thrown out of heaven? No. It's a it's simple question. It wasn't a trick question. Simple question. Okay? Answer is no. Because old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This second kingdom. Remember, when God does things one time, it's good. When God does things second time, it's perfect. Think of the Old Testament. Old Testament's good. New Testament's better. First birth is good. Second birth, better. Okay? And it lasts longer as well. Okay? So it's, a, it's, a, it's about a new birth. Again, any gospel, any pretend gospel that does not bring a substantial change in how that person thinks, how that person responds to sin, how that person responds to uh, seeking God's kingdom, seeking what God wants in their life. Anybody who does not bear the fruit of being born again is probably not born again. There are false brethren, false believers. Temporary saints. People who come in for a while, they taste it of the heavenly gift. They try it out for a while. Something happens, the thorns crud out the word, or the stony ground chokes out the word that has no root. Something happens, and they're no longer there anymore. And they're not. Or, here's what's worse. I believe it's possible for a person to be a stony ground seed recipient and still go to church the rest of their life. It's just that they don't believe. And I'll give you the illustration of uh, Brent Hutzel, Mike Hutzel's other son. He went and took a church out in South Carolina. It's a fairly good sized church. Uh, he preached there. A lot of people loved it because he's preaching kind of the way his dad preached. So they voted him in. There was a man in that church. He had a lot of money. And he had a lot of influence, even though he never sat on any board of the church. And this was a church that had a, had a board for everything. Okay? If they were going to change the numbers out on the thing out here in the lobby there was a board that covered that they had board meetings i mean some churches have board meetings for everything well this guy wasn't on any board of the church but he had family members on just about every board of that church he always was behind the scenes this man owned a bunch of pharmacies he owned a chain of pharmacies in that area and as brent first got there him and his wife and his kids the man went to Brent and he said, um, where are you going to send your kids to school? Are you going to homeschool them or what? And, and Brent said, well, there's a Christian school here we heard was pretty good. We're going to put them in there. And the guy said, I'll pay their tuition. Don't worry about it. Wow. 
and this is great. Okay? And he said, he told me right then, he said, Mike, I should have figured it out. But he said, after a while, the church treasurer came to him and showed him the books and said, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but that man deposits $100,000 into the church account at the beginning of every year. And throughout the year, he then removes that money pieces at a time. Until it runs out, he'll put in another 100000 and after a while, he starts taking it out. And he said, why is he doing that? I said, I don't know, but he's been doing it for years. So he called uh, Jay Sekulow, who was uh, Donald Trump's, one of his impeachment lawyers. Runs a Christian law type association. Then he called um, uh, Gibbs, David Gibbs, Christian Law Association, asked them about it. And they both told him he's laundering money through the church. And your church is going to get caught. And they're going to bust you guys. And now that you know as a pastor, you're going down. And they said, you need to step in and put a stop to this right now. So he called a meeting with the guy. A lunch meeting. And he showed him everything. And he showed him what those two law agencies told him. And the guy leaned back and he said, I thought you were smarter than that. He said, what do you mean? And the guy said, why don't you just take the money... And be content. Keep your mouth shut. He said, the former pastor did. And Brent said, I'm not the former pastor. And he said, well, I'm just letting you know right now. You try to fight this, you won't be here very long. And they held a meeting on that pastor. Voted him out. Because he caught the guy laundering money through the church. So that's what I mean. Here's a guy that's got stony ground or thorns in his life. Lust, greed, love of money. He's got that in his life. He's using the church's tax-exempt status to launder. And he justified it by saying, you know, I give away drugs to people who can't afford them. And that's the account that I use. He's made it sound like he's a saint. And uh, that kind of stuff goes on probably a lot. Uh, A pastor I know took a church and everybody in the world warned him, don't take that church. Why not? It's owned by one guy. This guy owns the building, he owns the property, and he owns the bank account. And that church is his business. And if you preach against certain things, you'll find yourself out of a job very quickly because he'll run you off. Sure enough, he's there about six, eight months, gone. Okay? That kind of stuff happens a lot. Amen? So, is he born again? Ain't no way. Ain't no way. In a way, you're born again, serving the kingdom of God, and yet you love mammon which is money, okay? There's always got to be the fruit manifested, amen? Then the gospel will always be contained in the scriptures and no other place. It has no other source than the scriptures. If I get a revelation from God tonight saying, Mike, you're going to start teaching them now that the gospel, they can have eternal life through increase of their tithe. So instead of 10%, it's now 20%. And after a while, you'll be able to do it. You'll be able to to convince them into believing that they must give now 20% instead of 10% in order to be saved or stay saved. That's not anywhere in the Bible. Not, Not even tithe paying is related to the gospel and your salvation. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and 
by the scriptures of the prophets. Very important. According to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. How did Martin Luther learn the gospel? He read it in Romans. Okay. How does anybody else know the gospel? They heard somebody say John 3.16, for God so loved the world. They heard somebody say Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 8.10, 8, 10, 8 9, 10, 1 John 1, 1.9, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. They heard those verses given to them, and they accepted Jesus because they knew the gospel. Amen? That's how it's done. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24. For all flesh is as grass. And all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. So you've heard my explanation on this. The original writings of the Bible were written on papyrus, which is a grass. They take and split it. You know, grass comes in layers. They would spread out the layers, weave them together, spread them out, shut them out before the sun, let the sun dry them, and now they have parchment. They have papyrus to write on. That would last a couple hundred years. But if it's used a lot, I mean, what happens? Does anybody have an old Bible that the pages are all coming apart and they're just, okay? What happens? You keep unrolling the same scroll, touching it with your hands. It's going to break up. It's going to chip away. It's going to dry up. It's going to break in pieces. God knew that. So God swore, even though the grass is withering, that I wrote this on, don't worry. I'll make a copy of it. And I'll make sure that it's right because I preserve my word. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever and this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you so if you preach a message to somebody but are not using scripture are they really saved i had a young man in new york i had mentioned something like this I said, if you're going to talk to somebody about Jesus, give them Bible verses. And he'd heard me say things like new paradigm or a paradigm shift. And he raised his hand. He said, but when I, he was a young man, when I talk to people, I use words, you know, kind of like what you were saying, because those are words they will understand. They want to understand the Bible. So I give them words they can understand. And I'm said, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. Your words are corrupt. And this was a King James church. Your words are corrupt. So why are you saying then that you believe that your words have a better chance of altering somebody's life than the pure words of God? He didn't come back the next night, but... The word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Now this. Turn to Philippians 1. Three places there we're going to look at. So here's why I asked this question earlier. Let's say Islam, Buddhism, Shintoism. What other kind of religions are there? Name some religions. Huh? Let's keep it a non-Christ-based religion. Scientology. Huh? Witches and pagan. Paganism. Satanism, of course. Some of the major ones there. Huh? No, I didn't. Hindu. Okay. You know, if I were to call Pastor Rock and ask him, Pastor, are there Hindu temples that are not true Hindu temples? They're impersonating Hindu temples in order to deceive Hindus into a different religion. 
No, there's not. Are there people who infiltrate Muslim mosques, pretend to be Muslims, but then attempt them to draw them to a false version of Islam? Are there those who pray to Buddha and worship Buddha, worship Buddha temples, Buddha idols, practice Buddhism? Is there a fake Buddha? No. Gospel Christianity is the only religion in the world where you have a constant attempt at faking it and drawing people out of pure Christianity to some alternative version of Christianity. See my point? Nobody has to defend Buddhism. Anybody can be a Buddhist. Nobody has to defend Islam. There are no fake Islam mosques out there. And the, other, and the real Muslims say, oh, those are fake Muslims. Okay? As far as I know, it doesn't exist. It only exists in real Christianity. You have false churches, false offshoots of Christianity, false branches of Christianity, and in every single one of them, they've all corrupted the gospel somehow, some way. Probably by adding a work to it. Um, the people, some of the people that left the branch Davidian compound, Koresh cursed them. He said, if you leave me, don't expect to see me in heaven. He told him, if you leave me, you're walking out on God. He threatened him. Okay? Uh, there was a guy, an older man, him and his wife joined Koresh's cult. David had a revelation from God that God told him to marry this man's 14-year-old daughter. So the man let him. The man's wife threw a royal fit. Those are my daughters, you pervert. I'm not letting you sleep with my daughter. She's 14 years old. Kicked her out. Kicked her out. Texas law allows a 14-year-old to be married as long as the parent gives consent. That man willingly signed his daughter's life over to David Koresh. Then he went after her 12-year-old sister. Tell me what kind of Christ that was. An anti one. The gospel always has to be defended. Always. Philippians 1.7 even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. Notice that he mentions the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Paul was aware. Paul, remember, Paul said it in the book of Acts. Near the, near the end of his life and ministry, Paul told everybody, he says, I know that after my departure, grievous wolves will come in, not sparing the flock. He said, that I know they're going to come in. They're going to pretend to be the apostles of Christ. They're going to give out a false gospel. They're going to make converts to themselves. And they're going to steal people right out of the church that I just left. And lo and behold, he builds, he starts the churches in the Galatia area, gets them built up in the doctrine, establishes bishops in those churches. He leaves to go on to the next place. All of a sudden, he's getting a letter 
from somebody in those churches saying, uh, Paul, did you know that there's a bunch of people here, they were here when you left, you know who they are. They came in and started telling all of us Gentiles, we had to get circumcised and follow the Mosaic law in order to really be saved. Well, that wiped Paul the wrong way. He said, how dare they? So he starts out Galatians chapter 1. How is it that you are so far removed from the gospel? To another gospel. And he said, it's not a gospel. It's not good news. He was, he was very angry over this. And he wrote what he wrote in Galatians to convince those bishops, whoever these guys are, throw them out. They're bringing in a false gospel. I had to, at one time, a man preached that you lose your salvation after every sin and that you must get your salvation back by repentance and be saved all over again i had no idea what that was so i called mike hutzel and he said yeah it's, i've heard of it it's called repeated regeneration you are saved you get lost you're saved again you're lost again you're saved again lost again saved again lost again every sin you commit you lose your salvation you die in that state you're going to go to hell. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter if you were saved. You lost your salvation. You have to get it back right then and there. And believe it or not, there are some churches that believe that. Some churches that teach that. And um, when I found that out, I had to stand. Brother Sterling was with me. And I had to stand against it. Twice. And I didn't like doing that. But I'm not going to have anybody, I'm not going to let anybody preach to the people that listen to this church or are part of this church that their salvation is just hanging on a bare thread. And the first thing they do wrong, God's going to cut them off. I'm not going to have it. That's a false gospel. Um... Defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. Philippians 1, 17. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. So there would be some that say the whole purpose of the church is to preach the gospel. Well, yeah, that is a purpose of the church. But is, it is not just enough for a church to to teach and preach people the gospel, that church must also stand and defend that gospel. So we had a couple that came and they were asked Jesus into their heart and we was excited about it. The night I baptized them there, they invited a, a, a family, a couple family members of theirs. And I, when I shook their hand, I'm going, eh, something ain't right about these people. And sure enough, they convinced those new converts before I had a chance to start teaching them in the ways of the gospel. Before I had a chance, those people were telling them, well, you got saved there, but you need to get out of that church because they don't have the Holy Ghost there. Because God says that if you really have the Holy Ghost, you'll speak in tongues and you'll be healed of all your diseases. And then they tried to bring that into this church through a study group. And I went, I cut it off. I said, I'm not going to have that. But it, they, they left. They were here three weeks. Boom, gone. That's all it took. So it has to be preached, but it has to be defended. Philippians 1.27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent. I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit and with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to be the Department of Homeland Security telling you if you see something, say something. But I will tell you, because I've seen it, not just in this church, I've seen it in other churches. Uh, I was part of a mission church out in Oklahoma City. And the church at the time was meeting in a, in a YMCA building we reserved on Sunday. 
The pastor told me that he got there early and he was setting chairs up and a guy showed up early, like an hour early. And of course, you know, it's a fledgling church. Anybody that shows up, hey, yeah, we want them. So the pastor got to talking to this man. You know, what brings you here? And eventually the man said, well, I believe God has led me. I'm a born again believer, full of the Holy Spirit. And he said, I believe God has led me over to this church to make sure this church flows in the Holy Spirit and speaks in tongues. And the pastor said, get out. Get out. You're not going to come in here and bring that in here. I'm putting you out now. And if you try to come back again, you're going to meet me. And this pastor was a big guy. And he said, if you come again, you're going to meet me at the door. And I'll have some guys with me. But you are never coming in this church with that garbage. Oh, God, of course, this church. We'll see. We'll see. But I'm telling you right now, leave. Because he knew what that... Oklahoma, Texas, full of these charismatic people. Full of it. And they send out missionaries to go to try to bring those gifts to churches. My goodness. I'm going to roll here. Let me finish this. Warning of a different gospel. Four places. I've mentioned this. 2 Corinthians 11, 4. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus whom you have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Paul said people are going to believe it, no matter what. Galatians 1. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven, and I want you to underline that in your Bible because I am reasonably sure that's going to happen. It's already happened a little bit with Joe Smith, the angel moron I. Okay, maybe some others. Ellen White said an angel showed her that fourth commandment had to be kept or nobody was going to heaven if they didn't keep the fourth commandment. So I guarantee you, and if I'm wrong, we'll all get to heaven and you'll forget about it. But I guarantee you, an angel or angels are going to come down from heaven and they're going to be bringing another gospel. I can see biblically how it's going to happen. And people are going to believe it. Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel on you than that we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now, if any man preach another gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. So here's the question. If you do preach a different gospel, are you going to heaven? Cursed means cursed, damned, doomed. And we have one that came out of this church. You probably know who I'm talking about. You pray for him. That it's not too late. He's changed, literally made major doctrinal shifts at least five times since I've known him. And he's doing it again through Hebrew law keeping. Spurred on by his mother-in-law. And I knew that would happen. Pray for him. Pray for him. Because he's in danger. Maybe God's taking him through this to show him that it's wrong. Maybe God will correct him. Hey, God did it with me. So my hope and prayer is that God will correct him. But if he doesn't, he's not going to heaven. 
And all the people that follow him are not going either because they are accursed. Amen? It's that serious. God, when these people say, oh, there's many roads to God, God says, no, I made one. And he sticks with it. Billy Graham had to go stand before God, and God would ask him, Billy, why did you, with, what was his name, the Hour of Power, out in California, can't remember who, I'm, he used to have a TV show every Sunday morning, huh? Not, not Falwell, uh, sh- I won't say Schumer, but it ain't Schumer. Anyway, he gets on his program. This guy's liberal anyway, and they're both talking about Muslims. And Billy Graham said, I now believe that even Muslims who truly believe in God, God will accept that. That they're actually going to heaven through Jesus, even if they don't acknowledge that it's through Jesus. It's wicked. He had to go tell God. Try to come up with a good excuse about that. What is his name? I'll think about 3 o'clock in the morning and I'll call everybody.